you have your Bibles, would you please join me in turning in them to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. For those of you who don't know, as of June of this year, so about a month away, our church is turning six years old. By the grace of God, we are turning six years old. And um, as uh, we're looking forward to our birth month as a church, I found myself praising God, but also praying to God and asking the Lord for help, particularly what text might serve as an encouragement to us, to this local body, as we gear up for six years of life and ministry together. And how in that, our time together might serve as a time of being encouraged to excel still more in our sanctification, if I can borrow from Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter four. There was one text and one topic that really emerged that I thought would encourage us in the life and stage that we're at now as a church. If we're to thrive, if we're gonna persevere, then we need to take hold of the virtue of humility. This has been an area of needed growth in my life personally. And by God's grace, it has been Philippians chapter two again and again and again and again that God has used in my life personally to help me grow in the area of humility. So this text is near and dear to my heart, and I trust that it will be for you as well. In the opening chapter of the letter to Philippians, Paul gives glory to God as he commends the Philippians for their participation in the gospel. Notice verse three through five of Philippians chapter one, Paul begins his letter by thanking God for his remembrance of them always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. The word participation is the Greek word koinonia. It refers to partnership or fellowship in ministry. From the first day that these believers got saved, the first day since God began a good work in them, until the present day that Paul is writing to them, they joined Paul in gospel ministry. This was not an idle church, but a church that was actively on mission. They partnered with Paul in a number of ways, evangelizing with him, as we're told in Acts 16 verses 12 through 40, evangelizing with Paul in their city. They sent money to Paul, coming around him financially, as he notes in Philippians chapter four, verses 15 through 16. And they sent people to him, Epaphroditus among them in Philippians chapter two, verse 25, to aid Paul in his missionary journey. And what's encouraging about our church is that when I read the letter to Philippians and I look at the gospel impact that this church has, it makes me think of Revolve Bible Church. We're sending people out to share the gospel. We are coming around missionaries around the world, supporting them financially to advance the gospel. And we are certainly making an eternal impact in more ways than just that. But what is important to notice in this letter is that tied to an investment in gospel ministry is not only a return in spiritual wins, seeing fruit if God would be so gracious to reveal it, but there is also a return of spiritual war. Notice verse one, verse, or excuse me, chapter one, verse 29 and 30. Paul says in verse 29, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. The Philippians were experiencing the same conflict of imprisonment that Paul was experiencing because of their allegiance to Jesus Christ. In fact, as Paul's writing this letter, he was imprisoned in Rome. This, these are, um, this is among one of his prison letters or epistles that he's writing as he's under house arrest 
And that's noted in Acts 16. Scripture helps us understand that in varying degrees, at some point in time, opposition will come to those who stand tall for the gospel. And this is a reality that we share with our Lord and in the company of every faithful church. We're told by Jesus himself in John chapter 15, verse 20, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. It is coming for every generation to follow Christ. Paul, passing this on to Timothy, says something similar in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Paul knows this all too well. And he helps the Philippian church understand that if they are to withstand opposition, if they are to continue partnering with him for the sake of Christ, they need to protect their unity. They need to protect their unity. Notice verse 27 in chapter one. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. It is certainly a badge of honor to suffer for the sake of Christ. But as a church who's locked right in the crosshairs of the world, the devil and our own flesh, we need to understand that we have the responsibility to safeguard the unity that the Lord Jesus Christ has purchased for us and that the spirit of God has created among us. We need to be united. This was Paul's concern that persecution would invite division, distraction, deception, discouragement, and spiritual decline amongst the Philippians. Therefore, he shifts gears beginning in chapter two, verses one and two, and addresses their need to be together, to stick together. Verse one, he says, therefore, if, any, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. United in mind, united in love, united in purpose. Same mind, same love, same purpose. That doesn't just come out of thin air. As Paul's thought progresses, he helps us understand that the means by which we stick together and remain united is by embracing humility. Notice verse three, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. This is the same connection that Paul makes in the twin text of Philippians chapter two, Ephesians chapter four, which Dr. Marsh just read, where he says in verses one through three, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The Ephesians are to preserve their unity by walking in humility. We need to take hold of biblical humility. That way we can move into our sixth year together in lockstep. Withstanding the attacks that would come against us with strength and bond in the Lord. But the question is, and the question that that Paul would impress upon us this morning and the Lord himself is, are we humble? Are you humble? Am I humble? Title of this morning's message is Taking Hold of Humility. Let's read the passage together and then we'll work our way through it. Philippians chapter two, verses three through 12. Let's read beginning in verse three. Do nothing 
from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and those who are under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. So then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to open your word this morning. We realize, Lord, that not every body of believers gets to do this without assault or attack, but we get to openly. And we're thankful for that grace and for that privilege. Father, it is our prayer this morning as we open up your word, we're pleading with you, God, that you would you would open up our ears and our hearts and our minds to receive your word this morning. Particularly that you would help us to be a people whose lives are marked by humility. Would you use this message, Lord, in your word to cause us to audit and take assessment of our life? Help us, Lord, to identify the areas where pride in us needs to be uprooted and put to death and where we need to clothe ourselves with all humility. We love you, Lord, and we pray, God, that you would help us to also take hold of the motivation that we have to do so this very day. We thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three facets of humility that Paul sets before us. These will serve as our points this morning. Number one, humility defined. Humility defined. We're going to look at what it is. Secondly, humility demonstrated. Humility demonstrated. And thirdly, humility demanded. The demand to be humble. Let's first look at what it is. Point number one, verses three through four, Paul gives us a grasp on understanding what humility actually is. Notice verse three once more. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Notice the phrase humility of mind in verse three. This is one word in the original language, and it refers to possessing an attitude of humility, lowliness, and shabbiness. When it comes to understanding humility, you need to understand, we need to understand that it's a mindset. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking about yourself and it's a way of thinking about others. And this emphasis of humility, for Paul to even say this would have come as a shock to the Philippians because in that culture, the Roman culture, the pagan culture that it was, humility was despised. It was looked down upon. It was not held in high regard or valuable, but it was a despised characteristic inherent in slaves and in low lives. It was pride that was prized in that culture. Humility was seen as just sheer weakness. And certainly citizens in our society would agree about the same outlook on humility. That's just a characteristic of weak people. People who don't shake trees or move mountains, but people who are just victims. Paul helps us understand, however, 
that when it comes to pride, he gives two terms to give us a little more insight into it. Selfishness and empty conceit. The word selfishness refers to a person consumed with their own desires and pursues them no matter the cost. Empty conceit refers to having an inflated view of self that justifies selfish pursuits regardless of who is negatively impacted. Regardless of who gets pummeled or leveled, regardless of what the cost might be to the people around me, I'm gonna advance my interests, I'm gonna build my life and pursue what I want. Whether it be in the area of the career or the area of your family, whatever part of your life that you value most dear to yourself, someone with empty conceit and selfishness does whatever it takes to get what they want and achieve where they think that they should be in life. This is the anthem of our culture. We're engulfed in a cutthroat culture in every man for himself society that neglects their neighbor and can care less about the person next to them. And we know this struggle well, even as redeemed saints who are still battling our flesh every single day, we feel that pull and that temptation to esteem ourselves and exalt ourselves, or even express a superficial humility that is nothing more than a pride-driven performance. Church, when we look to the letter of Philippians, we need to understand that there are two threats to our unity. There is external threats, those who are outspokenly opposed to Christians, to Christ, to the gospel, but there are internal threats of pride. This is what was going on in the Philippian church. There was reports, as Paul addressed it, of grumbling and complaining. Philippians 2 verse 14, where he exhorts them to do all things without grumbling or disputing. And he also addresses factions in the church. Philippians chapter 4 verses 2 through 3, Yodia and Syntyche, he urges them to live in harmony in the Lord. If there's anything that's going to disrupt our unity and discontinue our ministry, it's pride within the church. But in Paul's mind, the death blow to pride is humility. It's the death blow to the internal and external threats. Therefore, we need to heed his negative instruction in verse three, to do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, to kill pride in our life. But there's a positive instruction that Paul gives concerning humility. And the first point that we need to make about it is that it, regard, it regards others. He, notice in verse three, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. The word regard means to hold a view about someone. And how does a believer humbly regard one another, their brother and their sister in Christ? They consider them as more important than themselves. To be of surpassing value. The person on my left, the person on my right, they're more important than me. They're of surpassing worth and value than me. In Mark chapter 10, verses 43 through 44, Jesus defines genuine humility for his disciples when he says something similar. He says, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. To see someone as more important means to see yourself as their servant. And you see them as the one whom you're called to serve for the glory of God. Is that the picture you have in your mind of your brother or sister in Christ? I'm here to serve you. In one sense, we all have the same value and worth 
because we're made in the image and likeness of God. We all have equal intrinsic value as we're one in Christ. And we learned that in Galatians chapter three, verse 28, not too long ago. But while we are equals in one sense, in another sense, to consider someone as more important of surpassing value than yourself is to purposefully deny yourself in order for serving them, to prioritize them, the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual needs of those in your faith family are to be on the forefront of our mind, occupying the center of our concern. This is a mindset that we must have, but it doesn't stop there. Humility produces a response. It is not just a way of seeing the other person. It is acting on that mindset. Humility not only regards others, but secondly, humility looks out for others. Notice verse four, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. To look out for them means to take direct and immediate action to meet the needs of others, to advance their interests. Put another way, humility does not end with leaving people the impression that they're more important it ends in taking the initiative to prove it. Maybe you fall short with just leaving the impression, whether it's by the words and the gestures and body language that you give off that they're important to you, but you have not followed through and taken the initiative to meet whatever need that they may have. It's the kind of short-sighted lacking faith that James describes in James chapter two, where people would say and look at people who are in need of food and water, be well, yet you don't do a thing to meet their needs. If our humility stops short at our verbal language or body language to suggest that they're important, that is called false humility. Moreover, it is called manipulation it exposes that you just have an angle you're driving at or a hidden motive to still reap from the other person. Paul helps us understand that humility entails following through. The word look out in verse four means to pay careful attention to the needs of others with the purpose of appropriately addressing the need. That is humility. It is a prioritization of others and the pursuit of others. But while Paul gives us a framework for humility, he takes things a step further to then take us and present before us in the Philippians the ultimate example of humility, to set our sights on humility in action. And there's no other example that he can possibly give that is more impactful than that of Jesus Christ. Paul brilliantly transitions to now showing us the humility in the life of Christ. Point number two, humility demonstrated. Notice verse five. Have this attitude, he says, in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse five Paul now sets Christ as the premier example of true humility because nobody humbled themselves more than Jesus Christ. When we look to Christ, we are looking at unprecedented, unparalleled humility. And between verses six through 11, Paul gives us three aspects to Jesus's humility that we need to see. The first is Jesus's regard for the father, his regard for the father. Much like we are to regard others, so Christ had a humble regard for the father. Notice verse six. Who, speaking of Christ, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. 
Here, Paul ushers us into the presence of the triune God, and in so doing, helps us peer into the mind and heart of God the Son. And when we look to verse 6, we are looking at, or hearing rather, Jesus the pre in, in his pre-incarnate state, the state that he was in before taking on flesh and becoming the God-man. And in this pre-incarnate state, the Son of God, we're told by Paul, existed in the form of God. In other words, from eternity past, Christ possessed all of the characteristics and qualities belonging to God because he is God. He was equal to God, God the Father and God the Son. All members of the Godhead are equal in divine essence. He was an equal member of the Trinity. And what we need to notice too is the word again, regard. It's the same word that we saw earlier in verse three. It means to hold a view of oneself and another. And also notice the word grasp, which is uh, referred to using something for one's own advantage. What Paul is saying is that Jesus, God the Son, did not use his equal status as leverage to get his own way or to advance his own will. But the mindset, the attitude that the Son of God had before the Father was that he was a servant to the Father's will. He had such a high regard for the Father that his father's will took precedence and priority over his own. This is the mindset that we get a glimpse of in the garden of Gethsemane. As Jesus prays in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, where he cries out, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, speaking of the wrath of God, that it will come upon him on behalf of the elect. Yet he continues, not my will be done, but yours be done. And in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus says, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. He had a humble regard. Father, your will is what comes first. And of course, we know what the father's will was as it unfolds in the text. Second observation we need to make is not only Jesus's regard for the father, but Jesus's response to the father. Notice verses seven and eight, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." what was birthed out of the son of God's humble servant mindset was willful and voluntary voluntary submission to the father's will. Follow through. Christ humbly submitted, first off by becoming a man, verse seven, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. As the father's will for sinful man to be redeemed and saved, it meant for the son of God to come to earth, to take on human likeness, human flesh, to become a man. The word emptied is an important term to take note of when understanding the incarnation of the son of God. It's the Greek word kenosis. And this word does not refer to the loss of any of Jesus's divine attributes or his divine nature. This false teaching is known as kinetic theology, which would teach that in the incarnation, Jesus retained essential attributes such as holiness and grace, but surrendered relative attributes such as omniscience, being all knowing, and immutability, being unchanging. However, if that were to be true, 
And if Jesus were to pour out his attributes, Paul would have used a different Greek word. And I'm going to butcher it. I'm a, I know Pastor Ryan has the confidence, even though he doesn't know it, to still say it. I don't know if I have that confidence. Um, um, a, a, a kecko. You can talk to Dr. Marsh. He'll correct me. Um, but Paul does not use that word to refer to the divestment of divine attributes. He instead uses the word kenosis. Paul in verse seven, by using the word kino, that Jesus in his incarnation made himself of no use. He nullified himself. And the way that he did that was by gaining upon himself the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. So Jesus emptied himself by gaining human form and human likeness, veiling and covering his divine attributes with human flesh, not by subtracting. And on earth, this is what Christ made abundantly clear, that he was fully God and fully human. You can see John chapter five, verse 18, and John chapter 10, verse 33. Lastly, John chapter five, verse 30. In the words of B.B. Warfield, when we look to verse six, we are seeing the God of this world becoming a servant in this world. Jesus submitted by becoming a man, but it descends deeper than that. He not only became a man, he lived for man. Notice verse eight, being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Stop right there. Jesus' humble submission to the Father was demonstrated in his life of perfect obedience to the law of God. Jesus Christ lived in the place of all those who are in him and who call upon him as Savior and Lord. Jesus Christ was the one who achieved righteousness for sinful man who is bankrupt spiritually and morally and who, have no, who, and who has no right to stand before a holy God in and of themselves. God dwells in unapproachable light. And because of Christ in Christ alone, we may be those who come into his presence because of the righteousness of Christ we have received. Paul in Romans chapter five, verse 19 says, through the obedience of one, that is Christ, the many, those who believe will be made righteous. The believer has gone from spiritual rags to spiritual riches. And it wasn't because of any merit or righteousness of our own. This is what Paul is going to make abundantly clear in the following chapter to the Philippians in chapter three helping them understand that his righteousness that he has gained by a life of religion is rubbish righteousness. It is bankrupt righteousness. It is righteousness that God considers invalid, filthy, because it is tainted with sin. And that goes, if that went for Paul, it goes for all of us. Because comparing our, our lives, even to the apostle Paul, we fall short to his level of devotion and zeal and commitment to spiritual things. We are bankrupt, but it is Christ who has supplied us with the righteousness that we desperately need if we're to be in a right relationship with God. It is one thing to become a man. It is a humbling thing to live for your enemy that they may go from unrighteous to righteous. But if it wasn't humiliating enough, Jesus' submission descends all the way to death as he died for man. Notice the remainder of verse eight. And just keep that in mind. He's doing this for his enemy, not for a close friend or confidant, He's doing this for those who hold a high hand of rebellion against God and who deserve the righteous wrath and judgment of God. 
verse eight, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus did not come to simply assess the condition of mankind. He knows how radically corrupt you and I are. He knows the desperate state that we are in for a savior. And that there is no hope in ourselves, in anyone besides him. But this was the grand plan of the father's redemption to give his life as a ransom for many. Paul points out that Jesus' death was a death on a cross, death by crucifixion. And we're well aware of this, especially after Good Friday that we recently reflected on. But it's worth noting once more that God subjected himself to an instrument of death that not even the Roman government would subject their own people to because of how horrifying, cruel, and humiliating this form of death was. Keep in mind, this is the king of all creation. This is the author of salvation, displaying unbelievable humility as he carried the Roman cross to Calvary and did not look back. And it wasn't just the beating as well as the nails in his hands and feet that caused the most agonizing pain. Keep in mind, although Paul does not explicitly mention it, the, the physical agony did not compare to the spiritual agony of being separated from the Father, forsaken from the Father. As Jesus became for the three hours from noon to three that he hung on the cross, the object of the Father's wrath. He became the target for the father's fury, taking every dart in place for every believer. That is how it was possible for our sin to be atoned for, for our debt to be paid by the perfect blood of Christ being shed in our place. This is how Jesus Christ purchased purchased forgiveness for all those who would call upon his name. This is how the wrath of God is exhausted toward those who are in Christ because Jesus Christ laid his life down for ours. First Peter chapter three, verse 18 says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Our God has gone that low. And this is a passage personally that I come back to, to personally be humbled. How staggering this is that when I'm faced with an opportunity to humble myself and humbly serve someone like my wife or my kids and they're annoying me like crazy. You know what passage I often come back to is Philippians chapter two. And I grumble and complain more than I care to admit about what I know is right and pleasing to Christ and what I know is right for my family or my coworkers. I come back to Philippians two and I look to Christ. At times I think, God, do you even know what I'm going through right now? (laughs) He knows that and more. Our God went this low. John chapter 12, verse 27 through 28, Jesus signed up for this. He was not bullied or manipulated as if he was a victim of any kind of divine child abuse. He gave his life voluntarily. What we need to note as we transition to the third point 
or third sub point is that when we look to the example of Christ, we can know that humility never ends in ruin. It always ends in reward. This is what we see with Christ. The father rewarded the son for his humility by highly exalting him. We need to see thirdly, Jesus' reward from the father. Notice verse nine. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There are two ways that the Father rewarded and uh, blessed his Son. The first is that the Father gave Jesus the highest position. He highly exalted him. This is a super exaltation, and it refers to not only the Father lifting the Son out of death, resurrecting him. But it also refers to his ascension to heaven as well as his present enthronement where he is seated down at the right hand of God. Jesus, as a result of his humble obedience, now sits highly exalted, occupying the highest position of authority. He has all authority and all power over every ruler, every authority, every position, every power. He is Lord over all. Secondly, the father gave Jesus the highest name. Notice verse nine. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ, the Lord, is the name that every knee will bow to and every tongue will confess. Everywhere, in the heavens, on earth, And under the earth, a reference to those in hell, acknowledging the lordship of Jesus Christ. As much as the the occupants in hell hate Christ, they will nonetheless submit to him and confess him as Lord. They must because of what the father has given him. This is the glorious reward that Jesus Christ has possessed and has been given. And it's this full scope of humiliation and exaltation that Paul wants the Philippians to have in mind as he shifts gears into verse 12, exhorting them now to humble themselves. And this is the third point that we need to notice, humility demanded, verse 12. So then, connecting everything that he has recapped about Christ He says, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul is not with the Philippians, but he knows that a motivation for the Philippians to humble themselves before one another is to humble themselves before the Lord. You can say in verse three, Paul is referencing uh, horizontal humility, but in verse 12, it's vertical humility. Humble yourself before the Lord Jesus Christ with all fear and trembling. Paul knows that it doesn't matter if I'm there or not to keep you accountable. What keeps every believer accountable to humble themselves before God and humble themselves before people is the Lord. It is the Lord. This is the angle that Paul is getting at. And he helps us understand, I think by inference here, that two reasons why the believer 
is to be motivated to humble themselves before the Lord. The first is eternal reward, eternal reward. Paul makes an implied connection between our humility before the Lord and before others and the evaluation and judgment that we will face before the Lord Jesus Christ for how we have conducted our life. He makes it explicitly clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11, when he says, therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, therefore knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Who's watching us? Who knows our thoughts and whether we are sincerely being humble or whether it's merely show, the Lord does who knows the thoughts and the intentions and the hearts of men. We will stand before Christ and give an account for all that has been done in the body. But to make a more positive spin on it, there is reward for the humble. This judgment that Paul is speaking of in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11 is not a judgment of condemnation, but commendation. Where those who have been faithful to Christ will be rewarded accordingly for their life lived for him. That is certainly a motivation that we need to hold in our minds and in our hearts as it pertains to humility. But there is also earthly reward that we need to see. The weird paradox of Humility and exaltation is not only true for Christ, but it is true for the believer as well. Just as Christ ascended in humility and ascended in exaltation, so too that occurs in the life of the saints of God here in this life. And again, Paul doesn't capture it in this passage but I want to bring your attention to several texts in the New Testament that teach about this. And in understanding the context, help us determine the meaning of what the exaltation actually is. The first, and time uh, does not permit me to go through all of these passages in depth, but I trust that you'll write them down and revisit them for further edification. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, Peter says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Peter's writing to persecuted saints who are undergoing various trials. And the exaltation at the proper time that he's referring to to the humble in humbling oneself under the mighty hand of God, which is an Old Testament reference to the providence and the sovereignty of God, is that those who submit to their life circumstances, whether they be troublesome, and in this case, with the Christians that Peter's writing to in Rome, they were. If you don't fight God in the midst of the trial and you trust him in the providence, in the, in the life that you're living, trusting that this is his sovereign plan that he is working out for your good. You trust him and you stay faithful to him and persevere. He will exalt you at the proper time. He will preserve you. He will cause you to not be swallowed up and engulfed by the trials themselves and derailed in one's faith. And in the same breath, by the way, he's talking about Satan prowling around like a roaring lion. There is protection for those who humble themselves before the Lord, who trust that I'm here because of God's providential hand. I'm suffering because that's God's will. I'm not gonna be 
unfaithful or use this as an excuse to be disobedient or try to take control and uh, fight for the desired outcome that I want, I'm going to trust him. The Lord says, Peter says through the Lord, that those who humble themselves under his mighty hand will be exalted at the proper time. Another passage, Luke chapter 14, verses 10 through 11. This is Jesus teaching a parable, the parable of the guests, and he explains who God bestows honor and blessing to among guests who are fighting for places of honor during a feast. He says this, but when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Those who humble themselves willingly undergo and embrace the lowliest spot who considers themselves and serves as the servant of all the Lord takes note of them. That is true greatness in the eyes of the Lord. And they are and will be raised up in a position of being honored and admired by those who witness them. Fourthly, James chapter four, verse 10. James writes, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. He will exalt you. James here is rebuking the believers for their outright ongoing sin, the lusts of their heart that are manifesting through the fights that they are having, the quarrels that they they are having. He confronts them and lays out for them what real repentance looks like. Drawing near to God, and him drawing near to them. But in articulating true repentance, he issues the promise that if they humble themselves, that God will exalt them. Again, the context would help us understand that God grants repentance from ongoing sin to those who humble themselves before the Lord, who confess their sin before God who admit their sin and who turn. The Lord honors that. He restores those people. He renews those people. He will exalt them and give them victory over sin. And in closing, I want to take us to one more passage. Luke chapter 18. Would you turn there with me? Luke chapter 18. One final reward given on earth to those who humble themselves before the Lord. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14. And he, speaking of Christ, also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is a groundbreaking parable that would have rocked every listener as Jesus explains who the door of salvation is open to and who the door of salvation is closed to. We have in this story, the Pharisee, who everyone would thought would go to heaven because of their 
spiritual status, their religious authority. And we have the tax collector who everyone hated because of their affiliation with Rome and their greed, receiving a portion of the tax money that Rome would allow them to keep for acquiring it for, from their countrymen. The Jews looked at these guys and thought they had no chance to get right with God. But we see in the story that salvation was granted to the humble tax collector who knew he was a sinner and cried out to God for forgiveness. He came to the end of himself and he realized that there was nothing that he can do within his power to get right with God, to go to heaven, to be forgiven, but that he was helpless in and of himself. And God either washed him or he would die to borrow from the hymn that we so often sing. He beat his breast. He cried out to God for mercy. And the Lord answered. One man boasted before God, the other man begged God. And this is the promise. Those who humble themselves before God who admit that they're a sinner, who confess their sin and their destitute status before God and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who stop trying to be Lord of their life and to take control of their life to try to manipulate and manufacture their own desired outcome. Those who abandon that and cling to Christ will be saved they will be exalted. The Lord will not cast you out, friend. The Lord will receive you and take you in. You can take that to the bank. You will be saved. You'll be justified in the eyes of God, declared not guilty, declared righteous. You will be raised up from spiritual death, regenerated, given the Holy Spirit, given new life, given spiritual eyes to see the Lord. You will be empowered to walk in the newness of life. You will receive a divine inheritance of not only eternal security, but reward that will not perish, but that will be reserved for you in heaven. But it requires humility. Humility is the mandatory means by which you must come to the place where you surrender to Christ and you submit to Christ. Nobody walks into heaven proud. They walk into heaven having been humbled. Friend, come to Christ. Abandon your ego and your pride. There's more to life than the ambition of you trying to gain the whole world. Don't forfeit your soul in the process. Come to Christ. And church, may we humble ourselves with a few things in mind. The strength and unity that will arise. The renewed gratitude of salvation that Christ purchased for us by means of humility, but also the reward, both earthly and eternal that is promised to those who humble themselves. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our time together. Lord, it's one thing to read your word and understand what it means but Father, our plea this morning is for power, for you to enable us to put our flesh to death in this regard and to help us be humble people. Help us, Lord, to practice true humility. And we pray, Father, that as a result, Revolve Bible Church would be healthier, that we would be stronger, and that we would be a church that shines even brighter as a lampstand in San Juan Capistrano. 
But Lord, help us. It's one thing and it's so easy in a sense to be humble toward those we love <laughs> in the church. It's another thing to be humble toward those who we don't like as much in the workplace or extended family or our neighbors or strangers that we run into. Father, help us to be humble and use us as those who, who emit a bright witness, a bright light for Christ through the way in which we go low for even our enemy or even an absolute stranger. Lord, would you expand and enlarge our ministry through our willingness to be more humble than we were yesterday. God, we ask for your help. And above all, we are so thankful for Jesus Christ, for his humility that he displayed and by it purchased our salvation. Thank you, Lord, for going low for us. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.